Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we're turning our focus to the town of Norman Wells, Northwest Territories, where the community is currently grappling with the consequences of an unprecedented supply chain disruption. Now, amidst record low water levels along the Mackenzie River this past summer, barge shipments, a lifeline for delivering essential supplies to this remote region, were cancelled. This has led to drastic spikes in fuel and supply prices as the town now relies heavily on more costly air transport to bring in everything from groceries to heating fuel. Earlier this month, Norman Wells Town Council took an extraordinary step, declaring a local state of emergency and voting to request that the territorial government escalates this crisis to the federal level. This move aims to secure broader immediate support for Norman Wells residents and businesses, support that is urgently needed as winter fast approaches. Councillors, along with Mayor Frank Pope, have specifically requested $6.6 million to ensure a stable heating fuel supply for the winter months for the community. And if the territory agrees to their appeal and declares a state of emergency for the region, it could trigger additional provincial territorial powers under the Emergency Management Act. Notably, this would allow Municipal and Community Affairs Minister Vince McKay to potentially regulate fuel prices, offering a lifeline to residents and businesses strained by soaring costs. While the territorial government has responded with an initial $150,000 to help offset these rising expenses, local leaders and residents say this is far from sufficient. In response to rising frustrations, the council has also questioned Imperial Oil about the sharply rising fuel costs, asking why the measures weren't in place to better buffer the impact of missed barge deliveries. The Northwest Territorial Government has acknowledged the urgency of this situation and has expressed its commitment to working with local businesses, Indigenous governments, council, and the federal government to identify long-term solutions that could help prevent similar crises like this in the future. Joining us for today's conversation is Mayor Pope. We'll be diving into the urgent challenges facing his community as winter sets in, the actions local leaders have already taken, and what lies ahead for residences, businesses, and the community as a whole if their calls for help continue to go unanswered. Mayor Pope will also help us understand just how serious this situation is and what the community is asking for in terms of funding, regulatory action, and long-term infrastructure solutions. Mayor Pope, thank you so much for your time and your uh, dedication to sitting down with me and talking about what's going on in Norman Wells. I want to start by getting a brief update from you, if possible. Last time we spoke, uh, the Mackenzie River was dry, the barges weren't being shipped, and your community was facing uh, somewhat of a crisis of uh, supply to your community. We are now at the end of October. How has your community been faring since we last talked? Very poorly, to be very honest with you. Uh, going back to last fall, we had to, to fly an awful lot of material that did not come in on the barge in at great cost. What we were able to do on the winter road, we brought in. We were lucky. We had a cold winter. The winter road lasted for its full six weeks. Uh, we had over five, 600 truckloads of fuel going to all the different communities that came in. And uh, we found out this summer again, no more barges. I think the Northwest Territory's government were a little lax in deciding that in May when we knew last fall there would be no barges this year. So what happened is Buffalo Air, who are very famous up here for the rice pilots, Northwest Territories, uh, they still have the Boeing of the um, Dakotas from the 30s and 40s, but they bought a brand new Boeing 737 jet aircraft. And they offered us what they now call barge air. They gave us a special rate to bring in bulk. And they've been flying in groceries, building materials, everything that we've needed over the summer. 
Then we found out just a couple of weeks ago, we may not have sufficient fuel to get through the till the next winter road season. So lo and behold, we are now flying in heating fuel, diesel, aviation gas, and gasoline at great cost to the consumer. Uh, I, when Peter Loyal, who are his suppliers, said that, well, they uh, waited for the government to tell them there would be no barges in May. Well, that is total crap. We knew last fall, they should have known last fall, and they should have brought enough material in to last us. So now we are paying, I think it was $2 a litre for heating fuel two weeks ago. That went up to five nineteen a litre. I'll give you an example of a young couple, just married, bought a house, they both work, decided they better fill the fuel tank up. $4,200 for one shipment of fuel for his, now, well, that might last a month. So that's what we're up against. Uh, because of all the lobbying I've been doing with my government and federal government, territorial government, ESO and Peter Loyal, uh, they did knock back the price by, I think it was about $1.65 a liter uh, off of the fly-in prices. But that is not a break. That is just a little benefit for now. We're still going to be paying that fuel price. Rather than the winter road comes in, the price goes back to normal. We're going to be paying that freight rate for a lot longer period of time. So there's no breaks in sight anywhere. Uh, we're still battling away with the Northwest Territory government to get our state of emergency sent to Ottawa. I know they've sent some letters from the Northwest Territory government to Ottawa, to different departments for help. I went down with my MLA a couple of weeks ago, along with the mayor of Tolita, community south of here. And we met with the senators, we met with federal government people, and the Senate were very helpful. They supplied us with the legal counsel, some of their staff, and helped us to put together a legitimate call for a state of emergency, which they thought would go right through. It got to the NWT government level. Our MLA debated it. He had support, we thought, from the MLAs. Then nothing. So I'm meeting with him later today when he comes in for the weekend and get a catch up on where the hell we are right now. But right now, uh, our, our cost of living, as I think I mentioned last year when we talked, the price of groceries, the freight alone to bring in groceries, went up about 275%. So a bottle of water that uh, cost you uh, 99 cents in the city cost me $6 here. That's just a bottle of water off the shelf. That's an example of what we're up against. We have worked very hard over the last, in fact, since before COVID, to put together what we used to call a kitchen cupboard, where people could bring in some stuff that they don't need and pick up something that they might need. And that, that is now a fully fledged food bank. We've got that food bank fully stocked. We're going to be bringing a lot more stuff in very soon. We have not put one dollar of taxpayers' money into that food bank. It has all totally been from donations. The business community, oil companies, in fact, Imperial Oil put money into it, Enbridge Pipelines put money into it, and just residents have put money into it. And then last week, because the GNOD didn't really know how to look after residents, um, they, they, sorry, they, they did a, a little thing to help the business community with the high cost of living and to look after some of their costs. But they did nothing initially for individuals who are having a hard time. So they came through with $150,000 to our food bank. I went and talked to them and said, look, if you guys don't know what we do, we do. Give us a contribution to our food bank and we'll make sure that nobody goes hungry. So that's where we are right now. I have a staff working on... Uh, we do deliveries. If somebody's a little embarrassed to come and go to the food bank, that's fine. Just uh, tell us what you need. And we have a little vehicle uh, with staff, and we'll deliver it to you. We'll bring it to your house. We're up to about 40 families 
and individuals using that food bank now. And and in the state of a city, 40 families is nothing. When you want 700 people, 40 families is pretty extensive. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're looking after people. We're continuing to fight. I don't just want that little break we got from Imperial Oil. I want every dollar spent to fly in any petroleum product covered. We should not have to pay for that. We should not have to endure that. And uh, that's why the fight continues. As I said, Danny, our MLA will be here today. We'll discuss it and we'll come up with next steps. We're not finished. This is, this is just a start. It sounds like it's just a start. And I want to talk about the oil, the, the, the heating, because um, we are about weeks away, if not just at the cusp of the cold weather starting to set in. And I say cold weather as in minus 40, and I'm not sure about Norman Wells, but I can imagine it does get cold there. And the colder weather means that you're burning fuel a lot quicker. That is correct. But I'll tell you what, we've got a break so far this fall. It's yeah. only nine or 10 below today. There's only, no ice only on the nine river or 10. <laughs> yeah. There's no ice on the river. Halloween is normally 25 below and a foot of snow. We've got a skiff of snow. We've got no ice. And there's a, a mixed issue here. Number one, it'll be nice for the kids for Halloween. But we need cold, cold, cold weather so we can build an ice road so it'll last to get all our shipments of everything in. It's not just Norman Wells, it's five communities have to get serviced on that winter road. Colville Lake, Fort Good Hope, Delaney on Great Bear Lake, and Toledo. So uh, we were lucky last winter. Uh, again, 2019, we were 10 above in Norman Wells on the 1st of March. We lost our winter road two or three weeks before it should have closed. So climate change, global warming, call it whatever you want. It is affecting us greatly. I know that the uh, the town of Norman Wells did put a forward, forward a motion asking for $6.6 million to help offset some of these costs that the uh, community is going through. Uh, the, the territorial government did give the $150,000 uh, to the food bank to help with some of the costs. I, I hate to ask the stupid million dollar question here, but if they do not come to the table with more money, could we be at the verge of a humanitarian crisis within Norman Wells? Yes. That's why we went down. We got all the advice from our friends down in Ottawa as to how to approach it. We did it all through the proper channels and it got to the uh, NWT government and it was it had a, a, a roadblock, a brick wall. We don't know what's about that. But my fear right now is that these costs, even with that little reduction, I'm scared for people who are going to walk away and leave their mortgages. I'm scared for people who are just going to leave town. I've held rumors of people who said, once that winter road opens for light traffic around the end of December, we're going south and we will not be coming back. I'm just hoping that the government of Canada and the government of the Northwest Territories do not see our emergency when all our friggin' fro sorry, when all our homes are frozen up. Is that what they're going to then? They might be coming to evacuate Norman Wells to someplace else because, holy crap, everything's frozen up. Come on, guys, be proactive. Work with us. Don't be reactive. Uh, going back to last fall when there was no barges. This summer, no barges. Well, we know that. There might be not be barges for the next two or three or four years because of the drug conditions in British Columbia. But nobody's coming up and talking to us about a, a plan moving forward. Nobody's saying, here's what we're going to do. All I'm hearing is, well, if we can't get it in on the winter road, we can't get it on the barge, we'll fly it in. You guys pay it. Of course, everything that's flown in, who pays for it? The end user, the consumer pays everything. No matter how many breaks people get, you're still paying for it. People can't afford to do it. I can't afford to heat my home right now. If I've got to pay 3000 bucks a month to heat my home, I can't do it. I can barely scrape by at 1000 a month. I pay about $1,000 a month in, previously when the price was reasonable. Every month, I throw 1000 bucks on my account. I paid my darn fuel bill off 
in the spring when I got my income tax refund from the government. So anything I made, anything I had, went against heating my house. And that was when the rates were not too bad. That was an inquisition. I can't so afford it. Can, can, can I ask, where's the utility companies in this scenario? Because while Imperial Oil is uh, shipping up the, well, supposed to be shipping up the oil and the heating fuel to heat your houses, you're also getting, you're getting charged by utility companies as well to also deliver that service to you. Are they giving tax breaks or relief at their end of the deal as well? Or is it all just through Imperial Oil and they're just going to reduce that by the dollar sixty a liter? What it ends up being is when we estimated the cost for Buffalo to fly in the heating fuel, that means the people that haul it to the aircraft, the people that unload it at the aircraft when it gets here. It's a, a whole network of people working to get the fuel here. And our estimated cost for that was the $6.6 .6 million. And that was my initial thing. Cover that $6.6 .6 million so we can continue to live here affordably, heat our homes, continue to eat healthy food. That's not happened. Again, I'm saying not only Imperial Oil dropped the ball by not bringing in sufficient fuel last winter, the Northwest Territory government dropped the ball by saying, oh, we might have barges next summer. When we knew there was no bloody way there was going to be a barge this summer. We knew are that they last Are they telling you that there's going to be barges next year, or are they just popping that bubble no, they, right well, now? Well, from last fall, when we knew there were no barges this summer, they waited until May to say there were no barges coming. So then Peter Loyal said, oh, geez, no barges. We'll have to fly the fuel in. You know, it's just a completely mismatch of poor planning, poor thought. Everything is happening now is reactive. There's no planning in place for next year. We're anticipating as many as a thousand plus trucks on that winter road this year. Who do you lay the blame at? Uh, sorry, but who do you lay the blame at? Do you blame do you blame the Northwest Territory government or do you blame Imperial Oil? Or is it uh, a sort of everyone is to blame for what is going on here? Because when we when we originally talked, I got comments sent to me via email saying that, well, you chose to live in Norman Wells. You chose to live in a remote community where you rely on barges to ship to you. Who lays blame for this supply crisis issue? Is it the Imperial Oil? Is it the barge community? Is it the government of Northwest Territories? Or is it the people who chose to live in the community? I would say it's a combination of everything except blaming the people that want to live here. Yeah. This is the most pristine place on earth. That's why we are here. And remember, Imperial Oil have been here for over 100 years. Yeah. The oil field is owned the surface and subsurface rights to that oil field are owned by the federal government of Canada. So maybe after taking billions out in profits and royalties, a $6.6 .6 million ask is not very much. And to me, that was just a start. That was heating fuel. There's all the other costs, the gasoline, the, the aircraft the fuel, there's the, the diesel, gasoline, all of these. I want all these fig figures reimbursed and taken off that we are not paying for the full price. We should be paying for the same price as it took to bring it in on the barge. If there's a little bit of an extra cost to bring it on the window road, we'll accept that. But this, you know, going from $2 a litre to $5 a litre is totally ludicrous. We're just not going to accept that. But if they continue to do this and they don't have any relief for us, uh, this could become a ghost town. And Peter Loyal, they've got their own issues. They've got a repair job on one of, between their islands. They've got to get repaired. If they get that repaired, that would be good for the town because we'll have them around for another 10 years maybe. And that's where our taxes come from. We tax the hell out of them and that keeps our town running. We can't afford to lose them. So we've got to be careful that we don't want to point that stick at them too badly because we still need them. Yeah. The other thing is that if they're operating their oil field, then they produce gas, natural gas, for the turbines which generate our power. 
If they don't have that death, then all the generation will be done by diesel generation at great cost. I've heard five to 10,000 liters of fuel a day to run these generators. So that could drain, our, drain us again. So um, the cost of power, if the, if the power is going to be generated by diesel, then sure as hell they're going to want a price increase to pay for that extra cost. Again, who pays it? The end user, the consumer. We are in, a, I've said it a few times, I'm, I'm saying we're in a perfect storm and none of it is of our doing. It all came from elsewhere, starting from climate change and all the way through. Have you met with anyone from Imperial Oil since we last spoke? Many times. What fact, is there... yesterday morning? Yesterday morning, we talked to a local manager, and uh, uh, we he told us that, that he tried to clarify everything for us as to what it's like. And I'm, I'm sure he's very sincere. And but the, the the whole thing is, Imperial Oil sell the fuel to a intermediate who brings the fuel in. Then when it gets here, they sell it back to Imperial Oil. <laughs> so every step of the way, somebody's making a profit. We're paying for it. Yeah. We've talked to Imperial Oil, they've been sincere. We had a, a public meeting here a few weeks, a few days ago, in fact, with the community. We took notes of the meeting. Imperial Oil were on the line from Calgary. They, they were there to answer questions. So what we did is we accumulated a lot of the questions that came out of our meeting, sent them right back to Imperial Oil, and asked for written responses, and we got that. I, we're not totally satisfied with the answers, because we're still paying. Yeah. So the GNMT have let us down, I think. The federal government of I don't know where the hell they are in all of this. They don't seem to be too interested. Any support we got out of Ottawa came from the Senate. The people in the Senate, the senators themselves gave us staff to help us create our state of emergency documentation. So I want to talk about the government of Northwest Territories for a second, because you locally have declared a local state of emergency. But Correct. the territorial government is dragging their feet on this. You have asked, and they're saying, I'm not sure what they're saying, so I'm going to ask that question, is have... Has anyone from the government, from the premier's office to the minister of municipal and community affairs, told you directly exactly why they have not declared a state of emergency? Or are they dragging their feet even talking to you about this issue? Because, and I, just for clarity's sake, you just went through an election municipally in the town of Norman Wells. You were just reelected as mayor. So maybe they were waiting till after the election to see who they're going to be dealing with. But since your re-election last Monday, when we're airing this, have you had conversations with the Premier, or is that that conversation that you're having later on this afternoon after recording this? I have not had conversations since Monday. Um, I think that you're right. They may be waiting for me to be kicked off <laughs> the council so they wouldn't have to put up with me anymore. But, but um, I think I got a, a good majority of the community supporting what I'm doing. So then I'm going to go forward on their behalf. The GNWT, we assumed the process we were following was we would declare our state of emergency for humanitarian reasons, send it to the NWT government. They would adopt it and send it straight to Ottawa. It got bogged down somehow in the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories. What is, is where it is right now and what's happening, I'll know better when I talk to my MLA this afternoon. I, I'm not really clear why it was stalled. The word I'm getting to the Northwest Territory government is they have, written, they have met with cabinet ministers from the federal government. They have written letters to ministers in the federal government trying to get us some kind of support. But every program that we're aware of that they're asking for, it, there's no money in it or it doesn't meet the, the test for us to get these funds. So I, I think there's a, a bit of a hesitation here somehow to help us. I don't know why. I mean, they give millions of dollars overseas. They give billions of dollars to other countries. We're just asking for six million for now to, to get our so we can heat our homes this winter. Once we get that resolved, then there's all the other issues we want to go after: the general cost of living, everything. If we've got to keep flying stuff in here, people are not going to stick around. 
People are going, oh, we, just, we, we just can't afford to be here. I can't afford to live here. I might just uh, shut my house down, drain the tanks and, and leave and come back when things are better. My, my fear is that they'll wait and can declare an emergency on our behalf when all our houses are frozen up and we got no place to live. I hope the hell it never reaches that stage. But what, am I, what can I think? What can I look forward to if there's nobody coming to the table talking to us and working with us? I know that some of the GNW uh, cabinet ministers are working with us, but they're not making the progress that we had hoped for. What's the silver bullet for you? What is the thing that the province, the, sorry, the territorial government, the federal government can do to, like this afternoon? We're recording this at Friday, October 25th at almost 12 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. If you get a call at two o'clock this afternoon saying, Mayor, we're doing X. What is X for you? Is it just that $6.6 .6 million or is there something else that you're looking for from both the territorial government and the federal government to do today to address this issue? So that way we are not, and I hate to use this analogy, but we're not killing people by freezing them out of their house. I think what I would like to say is the first message I'd like to see is somebody saying, we are covering that $6.6 .6 million to, have to fly in heating fuel. We'll get that one done. That would be a, a good bullet to, to bite on. Then it gives us time to go after all the other issues. The critical one is heating fuel. So you can heat your home and eat at the same time, which is, <laughs> could be difficult for some people. We have uh, single income families who use the food bank and they have to. Um, we're going to be, as I said, flying in a lot of stuff, protein, good material, good fresh fruit, fr fresh vegetables and fruit. They can't all live on click and co <laughs> corn beef and craft dinner. We got to give them good, solid protein and food. We're working on that. But to, is, getting back to your question, I, no. But I want to I want to interject here for a second because I, I hate to pick on somebody right now, but I'm going to have to. You told me at the beginning of this interview, an average bottle of water here in Calgary would be 99 cents. Up in uh, Norman Wells, you're looking at about $6 for that bottle of water. Now, I'm no mathematician, but $150,000 from the government of the Northwest Territories to the food bank to cover some of the cost does not sound like it's going that far when you take into consideration you have to fly all these stuff up to Norman Wells, you have to pay for shipping, you have to pay for handling, then you have to pay for the upmarket that they're going to charge you to get it up there. That does not sound like it's a lot of money. I Circle the square for me here for a second, if you don't mind here, Mayor Pope, because the government needs to step up and not just give 150 They need to give more than that, right? To me, that was just a token start. We want an awful lot more going forward. You're right. But it was, it was, I think, it got them off the hook initially for how do we help people with the grocery bills. You know, that was a start. I, I appreciate that. It was a start. But uh, as I said, though, earlier, we want people to come up from government, both levels of government, and work with us and put together an action plan for the next few years. Don't just react every time something screws up. We know there's going to be no water in the Mackenzie River this coming year. Come and talk to us. Don't do it for us because you sure as hell have not done very good so far. But come and talk with us, work with us, and we'll help you do your job better. We'll work with you, but we don't want you doing it for us. We will do it with you. We need your money. You need our brain. Our, our intelligence, our um, traditional knowledge of the region. That's what we've got to offer. This is compounded this year because we talk about the Mackenzie River being dried up and that means the barges aren't getting down. But this year also had a major event that happened during the year that caused some of the planes to be detoured or even stop flying into communities like Norman Wells. And that was the forest fires in your area, your region of the Northwest Territories. A uh, community just north of you got evacuated and they got sent some to uh, Norman Wells. 
Has this compounded just not by the barge shipments, but also the plane deliveries as well? Because I'm assuming plane deliveries had to stop when the fire fires were being bought. No, uh, not quite. The, the aircraft were still able to fly in. But what did happen, the government of the North West Territories evacuated 240 people at Norman Wells. We housed them, fed them for 21 days. Going back to our grocery stores, last year on the Winter Road, they stocked the shelves, they filled the warehouses. They had enough that they thought to get them through to the next winter road season. Not a hope and help because all these people came in, we had to feed them. So we emptied the store shelves in some cases. So then the grocery stores had to start flying in stuff to replenish these stocks. And then we were caught with a high price of cost because of the freight to fly it in. That was a, another part of our perfect storm is that. We don't begrudge helping these people. But we people say, well, why did why did you let them come to town? Well, wait a minute, guys. We can't tell them not to. The NW government sent them in. The town of Norman Wells did all the work. We looked after them. We brought in cooks. We brought in people to help with the work. We got them places to sleep. We did all the work. And I know that the people in Fort Good Hope have thanked us greatly for our support of their people. You know, but... When people say we shouldn't have let them come here, I, I don't like that comment. No, and I, I did not mean to assume that that's what I was trying to get across. It's just I can imagine that exacerbated this issue as well, because you talked about how your storage of food dried up in some sense because people were more people were utilizing the food that was in storage for this coming winter. Um, yeah. We expect that the winter months are going to probably be a little bit warmer this year than they have been in the past. You're probably going to get your ice road in December, possibly even January, I would hypothetically say, because I think that's the last time you talked about it last year was January when it actually did freeze over. Yeah. What can the Canadian people do in the short term to address this issue besides raising hell and yelling at the federal government to do something because when one pe person suffers in this country, we should all pitch in to help that person. What can the Canadian people do? The residents of Canada from St. John's, Newfoundland to Windsor to all the way to Victoria, what can we do to help the people of Norman Wells today? I hate to be facetious, but a few of my colleagues around the, the table here have been saying, well, maybe we need to go to a, a GoFundMe campaign. You know, well, that that's not, I've never been involved in one of these, but people said, well, sometimes they'll work. I'm not there yet. I think we've still got to be both levels of government have got to come to the table. they got to work with Imperial Oil to come to the table. They own the oil field. They've made billions out of this oil field. Give us something back. Start off with the uh, the six billion, six million, or six point six million to cover the heating fuel. Then you come up with another twenty million or whatever it is to cover all the other stuff you've flown in here. Cover all of that air freight because climate change is here. We've seen it for fifteen years. People down south have just starting to maybe realize it's there now. So we're just saying that we're, as I said, in the perfect storm. Uh, we're not going out begging. We're going to work as hard as we can as a community with both levels of government, with Imperial Oil Resources, and hopefully we can overcome this working collectively. But I'm very disappointed that the GNMT did not carry our uh, declaration of a state of emergency for humanitarian reasons, adopted it within the Legislative Assembly, and sent it on to Ottawa. There's something, a misstep there, how it happened, I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. I don't know, but I'm going to find out because I, I'm very disappointed that it didn't go through. I'm disappointed that nobody in the federal government has come and knocked on the door and said, hey, guys, what can we do to help? Not a bloody word from the feds. Nothing. Has MP McLeod oh, not we been have, up there? We understand you got a bad history. Pardon me? Has MP Sorry? Michael McLeod, Michael McLeod, your local member of parliament, the liberal member of parliament who is in the liberal government, has he not come knocking on your door? No. I've emailed him. I've texted him. Uh, we went to Ottawa. When we were in Ottawa. We didn't see him. 
We were there banging on doors, government departments. We were all over. No, Michael's been kind of, I'm sorry to say, he's always been a good friend up right up to this last year. He doesn't seem to be as engaged as he had been in the past. I'm, I'm disappointed. I really am. The other thing I want you to know, too, when we were in Ottawa, we were trying to be proactive. So we went and met with the shadow cabinet for the Conservative government. They might be the next government of this country, and we're just telling them up front, hey, guys, we got a situation. You may inherit it from the, from the current government, but we're going to be banging on your door, too, because we're going to need help. We got a pretty good response, to be honest with you. That's good. But That's you, good. we don't just, we, we try and think ahead. We're trying to be as proactive as we can. But one of these days, we're going to have to get a win. The dollar sixty coming off was a no. I don't take that as a win. It was just something that was done. We're still paying for it. A win is when all these costs to fly stuff in are covered by government, whichever government. I really don't care. It could be Imperial Oil that covers some of that cost, but they're a business. They want to make money. They said they're not making any more profit, but they're still making money. It's their product that's selling. So they've been here 100 years. You know, they've been a pretty decent citizen at times. They do contribute. We need their taxes. So we want them to stay in business. We don't want to run them out of town. Yeah. We've got to have that good working relationship as a community with them because they hire a lot of people. They hire contractors. They, they're the lifeblood mainly of the community. We lose them. We lose everything. The last time you and I spoke, we spoke about one of the big infrastructure projects that the government of the Northwest Territories could do to potentially rectify this issue so you're not so reliant on the barges every year or shipping in the uh, uh, from air. And that is a road, a highway, a road, something that is more long term concrete that people can transport goods and services to your community every year. It has been about eight months or about five months since we last spoke. Has that conversation gone anywhere? Because I know this is going to be the conversation that has not just been one year and it's only been talked about this year. It's been an ongoing conversation for not even oh, your, your community, but for the entire region. Has that moved anywhere since we last yes. spoke? The road project, I just call it an all season road. Yeah. It's still going through an environmental assessment. It's going to take another six months before the environmental assessment's over. Then they'll have to come up with all the terms and conditions. Then the GNRP will have to get these terms and conditions. Then they'll have to go to the federal government for money to make them get the job done. They were talking there a while ago, like, hey, it might be ready by 2037. I've challenged the government today to have this road built before the end of the current sitting of the 20th Assembly of the Northwest Terrorist Government. I've given them four years to get that road done. It can be done, not six kilometers at a time, but big three major contracts. I've even told them how to do it and how to get it done. But if that road was built, we'd be, even if we knew the road was being built, people would be comfortable or more comfortable. I mean, I'd like to see the road built before the first barge sails again, because there may not be a barge for quite a while. We need that road today. We don't need it 10 years from now or 20 years from now. We need it today. Get on the bloody thing and get it built, please. That's what we're asking for. But that would be a benefit to all of us if we got that done. So my final question before I let you go, because I don't want to take much of your time, but I know you said you're willing to give me as much time as I want, but I am a cautious man and I know you have to get ready for your meeting here. Prime Minister Trudeau is listening to this hypothetically. What's your message to him right now? Uh, come and talk to us. Come and see firsthand what we're going through. Go around to take a walk through the grocery store and take a look at the prices. Go take a look at somebody's heating bill and what they're paying to heat their homes. Don't stay in Ottawa or go flying all over the world in your jet. Come and see us. He was in Inuvik about two weeks ago. Flew right over the top of our town and didn't think to land and say hello. I, I don't have very much faith in that gentleman, I'm sorry to say. 
that I think he could have done a lot more. Because our initial letter to him on the 5th of June was only responded to about two or three weeks ago. So I don't know whether he is being protected by his team down there and he didn't even see it, but I'm very disappointed that he has not even not even sent a note to say, I see your, I'm sympathized with the situation. I'll see what my government can do to help. Anything would have been good. Nothing. Sad to hear that that is what you got from our sitting prime minister, but that's the the name of the game in some sense. Um, Frank, I want to thank you. Mayor Pope, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking about this issue. I feel like this is not the last time you and I will talk. Uh, I feel like this is going to be a story that we're going to be following with great interest over the next few months until a proper solution is found to address this, whether it be that $6.6 million to help cover the cost of the you all getting up to your community. But until then, I truly say this, stay safe and stay warm because i can imagine it's going to get cold up there and if you don't get the support you need it's going to get a lot colder and we need to be extremely cold to get that road to last uh, till the middle of march to get a thousand truckloads of material in here i just throw one more quick one at you the community of toledo which is about 90 kilometers south of us on the mackenzie river have been trying to build a health center since covid that we shut down during COVID of what, you know. Buffalo Air with their Dakotas, the DC-3s, flew in 90 loads of building material to build the health center. Can you imagine the cost to fly all that material in here to build the health center? Whereas if it had been on the winter road, it had been on the barges, it would have been affordable. Just, just another example of what we're going through here. I appreciate you that. And maybe next time we talk, we'll get uh, the mayor of Toledo and the may a few other mayors of the region to talk, sit down and talk about this piece. I'm assuming this is not just affecting Norman Wells. It's affecting a lot of rural and remote communities in the Northwest Territories. It is because every community in our region alone needs that winter road to stay as long as it can to get all the resupply done. Yeah. Uh, it does stay a little colder the further north we are, but that is my big fear. Global warming will destroy a road and we get nothing in here. And Buffalo will continue to fly in here two or three days a, times a week. That That's my fear. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. Now, if you want to learn more about what's going on in Norman Wells, the link to their town's website is in the show notes. I highly check, recommend you check it out. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. Now, this story is of national of importance, if you ask me. If you can, head over to the Town of Norman Wells website, which is linked in the show notes, and check out what's going on. And if you can, consider helping out and donating to the Norman Wells Food Bank, which is in the link is in the town's website. This story is not going away, and as the winter month sets in, let's help out our fellow Canadians and give back where we can and if we can. I want to thank you so much for tuning in for this uh, this update on this story that as we continue. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. Now, this is the point in time when I start talking about hitting the subscribe button. And if you can, donate to the show. But I want, I'm doing something a little bit different here. If you can, donate to the local Norman Wells Food Bank. Because what's going on in Norman Wells is of utmost national importance. And hopefully someone in Ottawa will listen to this. Hopefully someone in the government will listen to this in the Northwest Territory government or in the even in the federal government. And make this a priority because what's going on here is almost an aching of a crisis. And if we don't fix it today, then we could see part of Canada struggling. So if you can, head over to the Norman Wells website. The link is in the show notes and donate to their local food bank. Highly recommend it. Um, any money that we may raise off of this show and any of the shows for this week will be donating to the local Norman Wells Food Bank. Please donate if you can. So stay connected.
Stay informed. And we'll be back here next time on Miss Wolf Harris. Till then, talk to you soon.